Um, good afternoon. My name is Kelly Boyce, and I proudly serve as president of the Chautauqua Women's Club. Thank you. Welcome to our Contemporary Issues Forum Lecture, or known as SIF for short. We hope you will join us here at 3 p.m. every Saturday through August 19th. As always, we have a fantastic lineup. Our speaker next week on July 8th is Scarlett Lewis, a Sandy Hook mom who tragically lost her son, Jesse. Scarlett is a passionate speaker who created a free K through 12 curriculum for schools called Choose Love. Please tell your friends, spread the word that she's coming and let's show her our support. The Chautauqua Women's Club is a vibrant organization with a very rich history. For 134 years, we've been dedicated to empowering the community through education, leadership opportunities, and life-changing scholarships for students. This is what we in Chautauqua call lifelong learning. To date, we have provided almost $1.8 million to Chautauqua Institution in scholarships for students in the schools of performing and visual arts. We need a... But most of all, as we learned this week, CWC offers opportunities to build lifelong friendships while enriching the lives of the communities we touch. We are a welcoming community to all, and that is why the Women's Club is known as the heartbeat of Chautauqua. If you are a member, we thank you and encourage you to get involved. Volunteering is the easiest way to meet new friends, and if you're not yet a member, please consider joining. We have a membership table over there. There's hope. Um, and you can always sign up on our redesigned, newly redesigned website, or visit us at our lovely house down by the lake next to the Athenaeum. This summer, we announced new opportunities for program sponsorship. We are incredibly grateful to those who have already signed up to support the Women's Club. They are the estate of Jane Ross Moore, Tracy Edwards and Jim Lynch, the Auerbach Goodman Sponsorship, and McGee Women's Health. Thank you, thank you. If you would like to find out more about our sponsorship opportunities, please, please stop by the membership table. You can talk to Hope, visit our website, or simply email me at president at chautauquawomensclub.org. Your support helps bring relevant, thought-provoking, and some of the best programming to Chautauqua. Today, we truly have a dynamic speaker, Melina Davis. She will talk for approximately 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes or so of Q&A. And after the talk, please queue up to the two microphones that we have here. This summer, Chautauqua Institution changed the Q&A format for Hall of Philosophy lectures to written questions only. We believe our Q&A format is part of the charm for our talks. Um, so we highly encourage you to ask questions, including the folks on the lawn that are gonna get wet soon. But seriously, in an effort to keep our Q&A as it is, Please keep your questions concise with no Chautauqua prelude so more questions can be asked. And please don't shoot the messenger if I cut you off. <laughs> Today's lecture is graciously being videotaped by John Vihi, which, which includes our Q&A session. So if you don't want to be videotaped, please refrain from asking questions. So, on to our speaker, Melina Davis. Melina is CEO and Executive Vice President, and by the way, the first woman CEO in 200 years of the Medical Society of Virginia, or MSV. Melina's experience has crossed many industries and at multiple levels in healthcare, technology, and nonprofit. She has been a startup founder, a board director, 
and her previous positions include CEO of the American Lung Association of the Atlantic Coast, Vice President of Core Technology, the President of the National MS Society of Central Virginia, and she also serves on the board of the Virginia Credit Union as Vice Chair and on the Credit excuse me, and on the Virginia Commonwealth Board University School of Business Foundation as governance chair. She also serves on the FAST Company Executive Board and Executive Committee of the American Medical Association's Advocacy Resource Center. The list honestly goes on and on, but I hope you're getting a picture of this dynamic human being. Melina's success hinges in, on her unique ability to bring different groups together to collaborate for greater good. Her entrepreneurial approach and ability to motivate and stimulate creativity and deliver impactful results has resulted in her raising more than $120 million for health and human services. Under her leadership as CEO, the organization's revenues have grown by over 300%. She has visioned several innovative solutions, including passing the first of its kind legislative protection for healthcare clinicians' well being by, by the creation of Safe Haven. Safe Haven has been embraced by the Physicians Foundation the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and recognized by the American Medical Association and is being shared across the country to provide support for doctors, physician assistants, nurses, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, and medical students. Melina received her MBA from Common, Virginia Commonwealth University and a BA in International Studies from University of South Carolina. I want to thank Leslie Strickler, Leslie, for introducing me to this amazing human being, Melina. And Leslie is also responsible for our redesign of our beautiful new website. And that deserves a hand, yes, yes. Melina is here with her wonderful and supportive husband, Jay Crabtree, in the purple shirt, who, might I add, is a US Naval Academy graduate. Thank you for your service. Last night, I had the pleasure of dining with two of Melina's key team members, Mary McIntyre and Jenny Young. Together, they have re-envisioned the Medical Society of Virginia. They are disruptors. Other medical societies around the country are seeking them out, asking, how can we recreate your model? So I can't wait for Melina to tell you their story. And since our lectures are no longer on the assembly platform, I have a little more freedom to describe our speakers. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm Chautauqua welcome to one badass CEO. Melina Davis. Thank you, Kelly. I think my mother needs to hear this intro. <laughs> I think she might really like it. Um, I'm so just thrilled that Kelly also recognized Mary Beth and Jenny because I was going to do so um, as well. The work that we've done is so instrumental, um, but it's really in large part due to their partnership. Um, I want to, before I really get started, I actually want to get to know who you are. Do you mind helping me if, will you raise your hand if you are from New York? Good. If you're from another state? Wow. That is not what I expected. Okay, helpful. Who works in healthcare? Anybody here or worked in healthcare? Wow, well, nice. Anybody with family members in healthcare? Wow. See, that I did expect. Healthcare touches us in many, many ways. Um, I, I'm here today um, to share some, some really interesting and difficult information, but the information is important for me to share with you because it's what we learned on our journey to um, how to save a life, honestly. 
Um, the most, I think, surprising thing I can share today um, is that healthcare is America's most dangerous profession. It's true. More than the police force, more than military, more than people who run into burning buildings are firefighters. I know it's really surprising, but there are a lot of really um, important reasons for it. I've, I've had a number of my friends when I've shared this say to me, really, are you sure? Um, but it is true. Um, and in many ways it's due to a variety of factors, including violence in healthcare. Um, according to the World Health Organization, it's estimated that 38% of health workers suffer physical violence at some point in their career. 38%. They also endure abuse in the form of physical assaults and non-physical assaults. And while physical assaults are certainly upsetting, um, non-physical, which includes verbal ab abuse, Threatening behavior, sexual harassment, it's intimidating to say the least. When patients and their family are tired, frustrated, or in pain, they, they can get triggered and act out. And, and clinicians tend to be in their path when that happens. Um, they can really be angry and all too often they go after clinicians. I know that this is a lot to take in, to think about, but imagine to make it normal for your life. It's so normal that you do it every day as part of your work environment. In addition to preparing themselves for these kinds of, of personal threats, um, clinicians need to go in every day prepared to deal with our best moments and our worst moments. They celebrate the birth of children with us. They celebrate remission, those, those moments when we say thank you. But they also are there during our worst moments, our most frightening moments when we have loss and they're standing there and many times holding on to us when it happens. Day after day, this is the work that they choose to do. And, and while our clinicians are among our most resilient people in the US, um, this dog agrees with us, right? They're very resilient. They're also really affected. The deluge of all of this is affecting them. In a 2018 study by Merritt Hawkins, 78% of physicians surveyed said that they had some symptom of burnout. Um, they were feeling something related to burnout in some way. And burnout is a syndrome made up of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced personal accomplishment. And it's considered an occupational phenomenon. Burnout affects all medical specialties and, and practice settings, hospitals, private settings. Medscape's annual burnout survey reported that on average across all medical specialties, 47% of all physicians are burned out. That's not burning out, that's burned out. Some specialties, ER and critical care in particular, 60% are burned out. Before 2020, we were seeing burnout grow, um, and, and it was around. We were learning about it. Um, the pandemic only made it worse. They experienced nonstop shifts during the pandemic. They had to be there with patients as they were dying. Droves of people were dying when they were there. And they had to stand in as family members because nobody else was allowed to visit. So not only were they caregivers, they were caregivers. They also um, didn't see their family members. They were really afraid to visit with their own family and loved ones. So many of them during the entire pandemic slept in garage, in the garage, or stayed at work 
to sleep. So they became even more isolated, um, and they didn't want to make their own family sick. They were trying to be responsible, but they were taking so much on in the process. Um, even during all of this collective experience together, it's interesting that they, they continue to sort of share in this stigma of, of isolation from one another and not talking about the fact that it affected them. So while they shared the experience, they were more and more isolated even from one another in that environment. Since, oh, Siri wants to join. Since the pandemic, um, burnout in healthcare has been growing at about 5% a year. Burnout and fatigue has become a major issue in healthcare, and suicide has become too common a factor across the professions. An estimated two to 400 uh, clinicians die by suicide each year at this stage. Um, that's about 28 to 40 people per 100,000, which is more than double, double the general population. Physician, nursing, and PA burnout and suicide has now been named a public health crisis. In 2021, I received back-to-back -back calls about two clinicians that were on roofs of their hospitals ready to jump, and people needed help to try to save them. They don't always have the opportunity to get help they don't always feel like it's safe for them to get help. And what we found is that it lacked, they lacked a lot of protection and, and stigma helped infuse that sense of, of lack of safety. Healthcare wor workers are burning down and out like a fading candle. They're fading away and our healthcare um, and, and health, and it's affecting healthier because they lack control, they feel isolated, and they don't feel like they can keep going. Healthcare clinician burnout also has an incredible effect on all of us. As patients, a burned out clinician is more likely to make a medical error. They're more likely to show less empathy with us and they're likely to make the environment uncomfortable for their colleagues and for patients. In fact, research shows that a positive relationship between a patient and a clinician is incredibly important to our healthcare and how we recover from a situation. Um, a relationship needs to be personal. It needs to have an emotional connection and, and a strong one. And if, if we have that with our nurse or our doctor, we experience a better recovery. Their being strong and healthy makes sure we are strong and healthy. And remember those statistics about 47 to 60 percent of clinicians being burned out? Imagine for just a minute if they left if they just walked away from healthcare, what does that mean to our healthcare availability? I think it's happening. So why am I here today as the CEO and, and EVP for the Medical Society of Virginia? I'm here because I'm driven by solutions. I, I spent many years as an entrepreneur and as a social impact leader. And I found my way to the Medical Society through a friend who said healthcare needs people who are innovative, people who are looking for solutions. You can make a difference in healthcare, and that would make a difference to more people than you can count. I have to tell you, I wasn't um, convinced, and it wasn't apparent to me at first, um, that this was the right place. As you heard earlier, the Medical Society of Virginia is a 200-year-old organ, organization dedicated to making sure that Virginia is the best place to practice medicine, but also receive care. I wasn't convinced it was ready to be nimble. But I learned that each state has a medical society and that they're very instrumental 
to improving healthcare in, any, in each state and to make sure that it's evolving. In Virginia, we represent more than 30,000 clinicians, both doctors and PAs, and we collaborate nationally with all of the other states and the American Medical Association. We also are doing a lot of work internationally now. We work um, with Poland quite often with, with healthcare exchanges. We're also working um, to help with amputees um, that are happening, the amputations are happening um, because of the Ukrainian war. Um, and so we're setting up tra a trauma center in Poland to help people do this more, more smartly so that um, people can have prosthetics that work better. Um, we also were part of the Afghan refugee exit. We staffed all of the, the medical teams on the airplanes to, to, as people left and exited. And frankly, it was one of the most rewarding experiences of, for our physicians. Um, it's interesting how many things they want to get involved in and they love and that our organization gets to be part of connecting them with those moments and those opportunities. Most notably, though, we're known for advocating for physicians and what they care about, but also for patients and in healthcare. Um, it's what we do best as, as a state organization, and most state organizations do this. We not only advocate for laws, but how to redesign healthcare and things that aren't working properly. I was surprised by all of this when I came to MSV. Um, but I think the thing that I love the most is that the trust in our organization is very deep within the profession, um, particularly among with our staff and with their peers when they're with us. They will confide their vulnerabilities and their struggles in us, um, and they're scared to do it with anybody else. It's interesting um, and special because medicine is very tight-lipped and very stoic in nature. Clinicians are expected to be strong no matter what, even superhuman of sorts. We expect this of them and they really expect it of themselves. We forget that they're humans just like we are. In early 2016, the Medical Society, and I was, I was there part of this, we recognized that burnout and, and fatigue was growing and that we needed to do something. And like most other medical organizations and societies across the country, we began holding uh, workshops on meditation and resiliency, teaching them about burnout and how they could take care of themselves. But burnout kept growing. It just kept increasing. In 2018, we decided we wanted to do something a little bit different. We, we put on an event called Infuse, and it was designed to be a TEDx event where they could experience sort of a creative environment, and we could learn what would resonate most. It was, it was really special. We had a neuroscientist from the University of California at Berkeley who specialized in happiness and the brain. We had a Buddhist monk from Emory University who was a physician and specialized in compassionate care. We had a musician who had designed an app that stimulated the brain functions of children with autism. Um, we taught meditation that day. We taught skill building. We also had physicians who were willing to stand up and talk about their challenges and things that they had gone through, including somebody who decided to change genders halfway through their career. It was a vibrant and powerful day. The second day was designed to be a planning day, to look at yourself at a table with others and a coach or a psychiatrist and start at your place with burnout and fatigue and figure out using all that we were teaching how you could make a plan to move somewhere else um, and, and progress. What we realized this day is, like normal, 
they were willing to share with us, even in front of others. But there's something about that day before that had really opened them up. And they, they went deeper than we had experienced with them before. Um, so much so that it was this day that we realized they needed way more help than we were qualified to give. Um, in fact, somebody was so disrupted from that day and so vulnerable and open that he fled the space and left his car keys, left his backpack. We found him, we made sure he was okay, but it, it was so telling. We had the lead psychiatrist in the state at his table. The Secretary of Health, who was a cardiologist, was also at that table. They couldn't help him. It was that day we were struck, we needed professional help, they needed professional help. They knew it. The question was, why were they not getting it? It was so apparent, why were they not asking for help? So we started on a journey, like any entrepreneurial group, to figure out why. And we just started a listening tour. It took us about nine months. We had hundreds of discussions. And we realized it boiled down to one issue fear. They were afraid that they would lose their job. They were afraid they'd lose their referral network. They were afraid they'd lose their licenses. They didn't feel like it was safe for them to talk to anybody. In fact, we had one physician tell us that she was so concerned about the issue um, that she couldn't talk about a marital issue without feeling like she was both breaking a professional code and the law. Talk about isolation. Um, we spent then time trying to figure out how could we create a safe place for folks. What we did was redesign things to make them work better. And it occurred to us the first and most important thing is that we needed to look at the law. We learned on the journey that they didn't even enjoy HIPAA protections like the rest of us when it came to disclosures for their medical licensing boards, like the Virginia Board of Medicine, which I found very shocking and very surprising at the time. Um, so after some work and some research, we started conversations with partners around the state, including the Hospital Association, the um, Trial Lawyers Association, the Department of Health Professionals, and the Board of Medicine. And we were able to design the first of its kind legislation available anywhere in the country to protect clinicians so that they could have privileged communications and independent conversations from their lawyers, from healthcare insurance companies, um, and from, frankly, even their colleagues, right? That they could have a private moment to just talk and interact with somebody who had the skills to help them. It's been a vibrant solution, and I'm proud to say that we submitted legislation in January of 2020 as an emergency resolution, and March 8th of 2020, it passed by unanimous vote out of both houses and was signed by our governor at the time, Governor Ralph Northam, into law. And that day, it became effective. Well, the pandemic blew open about 13 days later. We expected that we would have six to nine months to get this program up and going. Um, that didn't happen. We didn't have six to nine months anymore. We needed to help people right away. Um, we knew that we needed a partner who could help us with the services. And we scoured the US. We had been doing this work for some time. And luckily, we were able to get them on board and, and help right away. And that group is called Vital Work Life. And they were tremendous and still are today, tremendous partners and helped us get this program up and available to clinicians within 100 days. 
I know. It was, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful moment, I have to say. Um, but then we still had to convince people it was safe, right? We still, we had to make sure that people knew and we had to convince their employers to buy it for them, to make it available so that their employers were also sharing that this was important and it was safe and that they were gonna give up control of the information. We are very lucky to offer 24 seven services at this stage where anybody on any shift can call a 24 seven hotline and talk to a master's level counseling service or counselor. Um, they can make sessions, um, also appointments and meet with folks and go through it up for a longer interval. They can also meet and, and have time with a peer coach a physician peer coach and talk just about leadership, your career, these pieces. And it's interesting that this has become one of the most popular forms um, of communication and help that we've been giving. And they also have access to a concierge service where it, we can help with life stresses and, and chores, which are really important. Imagine going to work and your child has a, a problem in the back seat. I won't name the problem, but you can imagine what a toddler can do in the back seat. And you have to be at a 12 hour shift before you go home and make dinner, right? Now you can call and say, I need somebody to come get my keys, clean the car and have it ready. You can actually get somebody to order food. Somebody actually used the service to get Taylor Swift tickets. So we were very <laughs> impressed with that moment. Yeah, we felt like that was a major win for the program. And one that I'm thinking I want now want it for my whole staff. Um, we're really excited that they're starting to use it. We, we have 8,000 people in the program now. Among the general population, about 6% of people will use an employee assistant program or a behavioral health program when it's offered to them. Among clinicians, it's one to 3%. And Jenny always says, I've never met the 1% of clinicians who would do it. Of the 8,000 people using the program, 49% are using the program now. It's huge. And Interestingly, 17% are specifically using counseling and coaching, the deep work, right? It's extraordinary. And I will tell you, this is unprecedented anywhere in the country. This has never happened before. We're, we've never seen these kinds of rates. I'm also really proud to say that Safe Haven is now spreading across the country. Not only is it in Virginia, it is now in Illinois and it's in Michigan. And seven other states have signed up to bring Safe Haven on to their state. And this is no little task. It does require that state by state by state, we go and change the law, right? Because you can't, it doesn't change federally. Medicine is managed at the local level and it's managed by your state board of medicine or your nursing board and so on and so forth, pharmacy board. So it, it's quite a task, but it's starting to really happen and starting to roll. And they're working on legislation next for those seven states. So we hope that those will be up and running in 23 and 24, depending on when their general assembly takes place. Um, so we've also found that as clinicians are going through this program, when they start to feel better and they feel healed, they wanna find a way to contribute back to others. So they've asked, can I be a peer coach? So now we've begun a partnership with Georgetown University where we're creating and offering um, training for clinicians to become a peer coach and certified coach. Our goal with this is to actually make sure that there are more and more and more so that it is the normal thing, but also that it's much less expensive um, and easier to access anywhere in the country. Um, Again, I'll just say it's really notable if you think about how stoic medicine is that we could get to the point where we have peer coaching as a normal and regular thing, right? And that they wanna do it with each other. They're asking to talk to one another and they're asking to be ready to do that. We also think that the next thing we really need to focus on is making it 
normal and acceptable to destigmatize this issue. Um, it's, it's really normal for a clinician to go 12 to 18 hours a day and not take care of themselves in any way, shape, or form. They don't eat anything. They don't drink anything. They have no social interaction. And then they go home, and the average um, physician spends two to four hours of pajama time doing paperwork after a shift. This is not OK. This is not healthy behavior, right? This cannot remain the norm. Right? So we have to make it acceptable and normal to have healthy behaviors in healthcare and in the professions. Right? So part of the peer coaching is, is opening that up, but also we're advocating to clinicians for them. We're championing them to them. Be healthier. It's okay to say, I need to sit down. I need a break. Healthcare actually is so stressed at this stage that they're not able to, and employers can't let them. And frankly, even if they do, they're not letting themselves, right? So w there are a lot of layers here that we need to change. Through the Safe Haven program, I would tell you we're challenging the culture of medicine, and we're working to decrease these control elements and this stigma. Um, and I'm so glad that we have so many partners with us on this journey. A few of the most notable ones that have started to endorse Safe Haven, um, Dr. John White, who is the Chief Medical Officer for WebMD and Medscape. Uh, Dr. Sandy Chung, who's President of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Sterling Ranson, who is the Board Chair and Immediate Past Chair of the American Academy of Family Physicians. Dr. Varun Chowdhury, who's the Chief Medical Officer for Talkspace, and Senator Tim Kaine has been an incredible advocate for us. He's the junior senator, U.S. Senator from Virginia, and he has taken on so many of these issues with us. And we had the great endorsement of organizations like the Dr. Lorna Breen Foundation and the Physician Foundation as well well as the American Medical Association. And it feels like we're just getting started. These are just a few of the folks. I think Kelly mentioned a few others as well. What's exciting for us is these endorsements mean progress. They push us to closer to a tipping point to normal, to healthy, right? You are part of this. We need them to be healthy. Our health care, our families are safer if they're healthier, right? We don't need them to be so tired that they make mistakes or they can't relate to us in a room. Our staff and, and our board and our volunteers are so proud of this program. It really has become an incredible passion project for us. We talk about it. Constantly, I think almost every member of our staff seems to be involved in this program. Um, our board has said we don't care what it costs. It can't just be in Virginia. This has to be everywhere in the country. Um, it's fueling us, but we know that it's this kind of energy that's going to break down these walls and the challenges. Um, we know that it's starting to spread, but we need it to go farther. And we need people like you to join us in this. Um, the Chautauqua Women's Club so graciously shared a film that we produced about this. Um, I hope you've seen it. If you haven't, you can visit our website at, at safehavenhealth.org. But I think you can also visit the Women's Club organization, which is the Chautauqua Women's Club Club dot org. org as well. I really encourage you to watch it. It is powerful. Leslie also helped create this film. She is a badass, if you haven't figured that out. Um, and I really encourage you to watch it. You will be moved. And I'm, I'm inviting you to join us in making this a movement. And I'm inviting you to visit our website, talk to your legislators, and importantly, I'd really love it if the next time you have a visit at the doctor's office or you're in the hospital, 
that you look at the clinician and remember there's a human there and they need you to see them as a human and ask, how are you? How are you today? I think we tend to think of them as superhuman and they feel the responsibility to treat you as though they and their issues are not part of your life experience and your visit with them. We actually need the human in them to be present. And we are safer and we are healthier if they stay in healthcare and they stay healthy. So I, I, I just invite you to be part of this movement and this mission with us and help us save lives. Help us save lives by joining us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Go ahead. They can come up. Yeah. You can come up to the mics on this side. Is that what you yeah. wanted me to yes. say? Thank, thank you, Kelly. Oh, and, thank you. And you can just start and go, and go back and forth. Yeah. Go uh, ahead. Very, uh, this is wonderful. Very needed programs. Thank I'm you. I'm curious if you have programs that begin with first year medical students, uh, clinical students, and continue through all their training through the residency. And what a great question. If everybody didn't hear it, do we have programs and offerings for students from their first year forward? And the answer is yes. In fact, Jenny Young is in charge of all of our student programming. And, and Virginia has one of the strongest student groups in the country. And we're very active. We believe in their future. I will tell you, the medical schools make it very difficult for us to interact with them on this particular topic at the level we would like to. They very much are so concerned about them getting the education, getting the hours, and placing that they're very hesitant to bring this program to students. They want them to stay in the bubble of the medical school. So we are working, in fact, before we came here two days ago, we met with all the deans of the medical schools in Virginia and talked to them about this program and asked for their help to break down this need for control. Control is a very big issue in medicine. Um, so we offer it. Anything that they come to or we go to of theirs, we talk about it, we offer it in any lecture we're talking about it, and they want to talk about it. Um, the, I would say the medical schools are starting to do their own programming around this issue, but it's not safe for the students to talk about the fact that they could be on anxiety medication or that they are anxious or they're exhausted because they have to, in many ways, answer questions for credentialing for licenses in a lot of states that say, have you ever been treated for anxiety, depression, or any other issue? We've been working to get all these laws changed with the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation um, to make it safe for them to do it. So through programs like Safe Haven, they're allowed to. Um, and it wouldn't even matter if the question were on there, but we're trying to get all the questions removed too. I hope that helps. Thank you, go ahead. Hi there. <clears throat> nice to have you here. Uh, my name's Dr. Bill Falsby. I'm a cardiologist and professor at the University of Pittsburgh. So I've been on the faculty there for 40 years, worked in a cardiac intensive care unit all that time. And all the things you're talking about her, uh, burnout are certainly very big and very real. The programs you're describing are programs that focus on treating the manifestations of burnout, symptoms of burnout as they're happening, which is obviously very important work. The question is whether you have thoughts with your organization at starting to get at the causes of the burnout. For example, survey after survey after survey, as I'm sure you're aware, show that the electronic medical record is a massive cause of burn. It's a big problem. It's big a problem. Positive, but it's a curse. And physicians spend many hours a day yes. not taking care of a patient, but taking care of a computer. Yes. And that's all under the control of legislatures and administrators and insurance companies yes. and your inputting data that has very little to do with taking care of patients. Yes. Yes. So whether as an organization you can begin to organize people to get at those core problems that are causing the symptoms you're describing, changing the environment. 
I so love this question. Thank you for asking it. So the electronic medical record, digital age, there is a question, is it helping us? Um, there are a lot of questions about whether it helps us be healthy, right? But the idea is that the more that we can digitally exchange information about you, the more that people can help us as patients, right? But it is wearing out our healthcare workers. In fact, it's typical to have three people in administration for every physician to try to ease that burden, which is adding to the expense of healthcare. Um, but then the, the clinician also has to spend all of these hours. So we have been doing a lot of work. There is a lot of research around what the causes of burnout and fatigue are. It's interesting getting at, to the, at the root cause. From an advocacy and legislative standpoint, our organization starts to tackle these on a regular basis, and we're trying to regulate and take them down. But we're also working with a group called All In, which again was started in Virginia. Virginia has become very committed to this issue and is starting to produce all of these sort of new national standards. And the all-in caring for Virginia's caregivers is starting to spread across the US too. But it's a collaboration between all of the hospitals, the medical society, the Dr. Lorna Breen Foundation, and we are all there at the table reviewing all of this information and asking the question to the administrators, what are you willing to change in your environment that will immediately start to take the levels down. And they get a lot of data and a lot of surveys about what in their hospital or in their practice is causing burnout and fatigue. The trick is getting them to realize that if they make a certain change on an EMR, how, how an EMR screen flow, workflow works, could really reduce burnout, allowing people to see patients for a longer period of time and connect with them helps the patient and helps the physician, right? Um, and the nurse, right? So part of this is the all-in effort that we're doing is to try to teach administrators, you can make a change that's good for the business and good for the person, right, in front of you. I will tell you, we've got more work to do. It's a big issue. Well, I've, been on a call before where an administrator said, I think this is really just a negotiation tactic for more money. That's not what it is, right? Cynical viewpoint, not always the viewpoint in a room, but it is part of the work we're doing, so we're trying. I would tell you, I think we're, we're at the very beginning of this effort, and it is where it's needed. Safe Haven was designed to help as early in the process of burnout and fatigue symptoms as possible to treat the human, but all of our other programmatic efforts are focused on this root cause piece. Um, we don't have a lot of control. We say all of the time, we don't really have power, we have influence. So we really work hard to educate and influence other people to talk about this and get involved. Sorry to make you stand there for so long. Oh, I love standing. It's good for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks. I hear. Uh, so thank you very much. My name is Steve Martin. I'm also a professor of medicine thank at you. UMass um, and an addiction medicine family medicine specialist. Thank and, you. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and as a family physician, you know, I'm, I have about 27 to 40 hours of work per clinical day uh, that I'm responsible for, and it's clearly impossible. And so the upstream aspects that you mentioned are really pivotal and unfortunately are slow to change. You may have seen the article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago on uh, the moral injury that, that people are, are facing in our profession. And, and this is not a burnout. This is uh, a systematic, uh, deep. deep winnowing of our empathy and, and efforts. Um, there are other efforts. I'm just curious that uh, there are also upstream that are, are much different than I would have expected. Uh, so I was part of the Boston Medical Center Union when I was tra training in, at Boston Medical Center. Uh, just this past year, where I trained elsewhere at Mass General in Brigham, a three to one vote, four to one vote for unionization at that institution among residents. Wow. And there really is a generational change of like, we're just not going to do this. Um, part of that change is though that people are not going to work full time anymore clinically. And so there's going to be less availability of care uh, because it's sort of a, you've played chess with this long enough, like the, this is what's going to eventually happen. Right. And so it's I wonder true. what your thoughts are uh, with the society and how visionary you're being. Uh, and thinking about uh, other uh, aspects of, of changing the model of, from sort of the corporatization of medicine to something 
we'd well, all, all you're hopefully. using all the big words. These are, this is wonderful. I love it. You know, I think we have, healthcare is broken. I mean, if you're a patient and you've walked into any doctor's office, you know that these people are running around, you're waiting forever, and then they're in and out like this, and then they spend hours trying to get you medication because the insurance companies are fighting them, right? It's madness, this whole thing. And moral injury, this, this is a really important point. Moral injury is, the, is beyond burnout. This is where we've actually injured the humans inside at a level. They have no choice but to protect themselves. And even then, how do they recover? It's, this is deep. We are really hurting people with this system. Um, I would tell you, what other things are we doing to be innovative? We're trying really hard to think about new ways where clinicians can feel empowered and they have access to other resources so that the work that they got into medicine to do, they are closer to and they get to do it. Um, one example is a program that we do in Virginia also with behavioral health. It's called the Virginia Mental Health Access Program. And we have just the longest waiting list for children with behavioral health problems that could not see a clinician. And of course, family doctors and pediatricians they feel real stress that they cannot get their patients this help and they don't feel comfortable giving this help. And, and there are stories of children who will kill themselves while they're waiting to get help. This is the kind of thing that's creating moral injury, right? Because they feel it, they are human, they're experiencing um, grief in the process. So what we've tried to do is actually work with our state to build a program of resources that include caseworkers and 24-7 access to psychiatrists from anywhere in our state where a clinician can call and get a consult and help their patients and can move them through the process so that they're not stuck there and that they are getting hours and hours of training for free so that they feel more comfortable and, and feel more at ease helping them in, in, with the care that these kids need. I can't tell you the feelings of, of relief and joy that are coming just from redesigning something that really is about patient care, that what that brings to the clinician. And, while it's not dealing, it's not the solution for the EMR question specifically, just redesigning something like that and giving the doctor's office access to caseworkers for patients, places where patients can go to get help and they feel empowered with the education and the peer consult, wow, making a big difference. And we're also starting to take that model and apply it to substance abuse issues because a district of medicine, I think you said, was your, was your specialty. What you're teaching on, very big deal. Um, we have an epidemic in our country and doctors don't know how to handle this one either. So I, I will tell you, we are not dealing with every single issue. I, we need more and more organizations feeling like they are entrepreneurial and that they have the the nimbleness and, and the innovative mindset. And frankly, they're allowed to get out of their hundreds of year old way um, and, and redesign things and make it work smarter, better. There's a lot of institutionalism around medicine. That's designed for safety. That's designed for learning. There's a lot of value there. But there's also a lot of muck. It's like pat plaque, right? We need to floss it out of there. Um, and we really need, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And we really have to redesign, but we've got to empower more organizations. And I encourage you, whether you're a clinician or researcher, a teacher, if you have ideas and you wanna serve, I really encourage you to reach out to your medical society and association and try to help. I don't know how you can help, but what I would tell you, the fact that you're raising your hand and saying I'm interested, even if it's to make phone calls to legislators or to say it's okay, let's think about something differently in this community and how it works. These things, even if you don't know 
what the solution is in the beginning. You're present and you're asking questions and you're asking the right hard questions, right? That is the beginning of finding a solution is being there to ask the right question, right? And being there to challenge and in a positive way, but challenge the norm, right? While still keeping the things that are good, we can disrupt the things that are not working. I think we're getting another question. That's okay. It's not a question, it's a story, a real quick story. Sorry. My sister sent our, our physician just a birthday card, and he called her up crying and th to thank her. Um, I don't know if everybody heard that, but her sister sent a birthday card and the physician cried and said, thank you. Human, human. I yes, sir. Quick observation. Uh, yes. I work with the dentist. I've been with, in the business 45 Can you years. Come oh, microphone. Uh, closer I'm, to the mic. No, closer, closer. I've been practicing 45 years in internal medicine, so I've seen both sides, you know, no EMR, EMR, and all the stressors. What we decided to do with the dentist group I'm, I'm with is we set up these small groups of physicians where we have um, a drop-in, if you will, at one of the doctor's house, no spouses involved or anything else, just doctors, own doctors, talking about sensitive subjects. And it is amazing the response we get because they feel like they can open up because everybody's a doctor in the room. You know, that's all that's going to be there. And it can be really, in, you know, revealing about the, the you know, anxieties or stressors. It is very therapeutic. After that point, if, if somebody looks like they're really stressed, there are three of us, kind of the old guys, we, they, we invite them to come over and we set up time and we talk to them and try to work through the problem. You're peer coaching. Or huh? You're peer coaching. Yeah. And so it's been very successful on a small scale because a lot of people don't want to share. Some people do, some people don't, but it's been, it's been therapeutic, I think. I love that. I love that. One of the reasons I love this, and thank you for what you're doing, it's hugely important. Interesting to note, and I, I should have said this before, one of the reasons that doctors don't gather like this often and talk to one another, or nurses or pharmacists, this is all clinicians, by the way, um, is because they're not sure that legally, that if they have a reporting responsibility, if you share that you have an issue or you're feeling anxious or you're feeling something, does that doctor or nurse have a reporting responsibility to their medical board? So part of our work on the legislation was to clean that up so that it was not ambiguous anymore. It's very clear that if you have a mental issue, a substance use issue, if you are about to do harm to yourself or others, that is reportable. Right, But if you're in the Safe Haven program, you get to speak freely and have these conversations and get attached to professionals who can help you. And we're next working on this sort of phase where you can be medically diagnosed and still have these kinds of coverages. Um, because you could need anxiety medication and still be very healthy and very good at practice, right? There's this whole continuum of care that we can build and work from. But I want to make sure people feel as safe as they do with you all. Clearly, you're trusted, and that really is the key. They need this psychological safety so that they can start talking, and we can get them the care that they need. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Huge. We, we, our last question. Last question. Sorry. So sorry. Thanks. Thanks so much. I was a physician assistant for 25 years, from emergency rooms to family practice to pediatrics. Um, and I'm kind of wondering, as you're speaking, I know at the start you were including PAs, but now when you're speaking, you're speaking about the medical associations that tend to be the physicians more, which I'm not surprised. But I'm wondering how engaged the PAs are and the different state societies are, the national societies, because I know we ran into the same issue. 
right? We couldn't go and get help and have it right. be on the books because right. it was going to come back to haunt us. Great question. So in Virginia, the PAs are, are members of our organization too, but nurses have a separate organization um, and pharmacists have a separate organization. When we first went after the safe haven law, we only were focused on PAs and doctors. And the Department of Health Professionals asked us if we would do everybody, anybody with a licensing board. And we said, we hardly feel qualified to do this. Will you let us try this first? And then we'll come back. And so we went back in 2021, and then that's when we covered the nurses, the nurse practitioners, the students, and pharmacists. And as we are coaching other states in this process, which we are doing for free, by the way, any state that calls us, our legislative team and lawyers will go with theirs through their laws and try to help them look at all of everybody at once. Um, we felt like we needed to learn with Safe Haven, but then we set up everything we went through and learned, we set up so it can be wholly transferred to other states and they don't have to go through that learning. And the national or the, um, the AAP, uh, is that what it's called, A AAPA, right? Um, I know they care about this issue. I know that they're active on this issue, but we have not yet started working with them, right? So uh, if you have any connection there, we would love to talk with them about that. Um, and we work with them, of course, in the state and these other states. Thanks. I'm more involved. I'm very involved with legislative issues in Connecticut um, and then cross-pollinate with the PA. Perfect. So. <laughs> yes. Please, please go to safehavenhealth.org and... and communicate with us. I'm happy to give you my card today too, but yeah, thank you. thank you. Thank you all so much. You're such a special audience and I'm very grateful. Thank you.